Welcome back to the House of Mystery, and I'm Al Warren, and sitting in with me is Stephen Lampley. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. <laughs> and uh, uh, now, now he's not doing his little true crime commentary today. He's uh, he's on he's on the show. He's going to be putting people to the to the mat. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and okay. So now today we are. Um, Kind of um, getting back to a story we covered before, and we've had one of the guests on before, and that's Willis Morgan, who did Frustrated Witness. Uh, thanks for being here, Willis. Thank you. And uh, joining us as an extra guest that uh, we've never had on before, and we're um, going to talk about his story and how it ties in to um, Willis's story. So uh, welcome aboard, Chris Stewart. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, um, so before we get to Chris, uh, Willis, how have you been, and um, what have you been doing for the for the past while? It's been probably been a good year since we've talked last. Yeah, I think it has been a year. I've been working on my second edition of Frustrated Witness, and that should be uh, out and published in a matter of months, several months, two, three months, maybe. Uh, what was the, what was the um, point of doing a second edition? Like, what what is it that? people are going to get from this. Um, well, yeah, there's more witnesses. Obviously, you have one of them on your show right here today. Uh, more documents, more photos, more of everything. It's just a bigger, better version of the original book. It's always good. Bigger and better. Um, <laughs> now, in, in the last year, have you had any contact with um, any of the Walsh family? No, I haven't. As I told you the last time, my, my attorney has sent him a copy of my book, but he's never responded. Yeah, I was just wondering if anything happened since we last talked. Maybe he would have come around or said, said something, you know, uh, it's, it's too bad. Do you ever wonder why he's just still not, you know, he's still... Well, yeah, I, well, I kind of know why. Uh, you know, it's like the Stockholm Syndrome. You know, the very people that have been uh, abusing him with misinformation and a false closure are the same ones that he now considers to be his friends. Yeah, yeah, it's really unfortunate. So now, now Chris, um, let's, let's tell people a little bit about yourself. So before, before we get to your story, um, who is Chris Stewart and um, what brought you to, um, uh, to telling your story? Well, I, I appreciate you uh, opening like that, first off, because uh, I'm a little nervous because, <laughs> you know, I don't do this kind of thing real often. Um, so uh, I appreciate you introducing me like that. Um, so what, what brought me to to tell the story is just because it's a, I don't know, it's a, it's about a 10-minute period in my life that, you know, that, as, that I've been able to look back at and it's... Just it was it was just a scary thing that happened, and um, I just see it as kind of I see that whole period of time living in Hollywood as kind of a kind of a crucial time in my life, and this was just you know kind of the mm, kind of at the forefront, I yeah. guess. Yeah. So it weighs heavy on you. Um, so, yes. Okay. Yes. So so Chris Stewart, let's start with uh, how old are you now, so we know where where you are. Oh, absolutely. I'm not 11 anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, four, I'm 47, 47 okay. years old. Oh, okay. So so um, you've lived with this a while. And, and now, um, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in, 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 in Hollywood then, or did you grow up somewhere else? And... Yeah, I'm from the Midwest. Uh, I'm from a small little town in southern Illinois. Uh, you might be able to tell by my accent a little bit. <laughs> It seems to stick with me. Um, so that's where I was born and raised, um, and I currently reside in Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. Hot city. Um, yes. Hot city. Nice now, though. Yeah. And so, and, and so what brought you to, um, to the mall at the time when you were 11? Uh, well, uh, it, it, we had just moved there. To, to Hollywood, um, and my mom took, just wanted to take me to the mall. I, I looking back, I, I, I've come to realize 
that I think that the reason why my mom was doing it was because she knew when I when when we moved. Um, when I say we, I talk about um, I'm the middle. I have an older sister and a younger sister. Uh, my parents had split up and divorced, and and so we didn't us three. We we really didn't want to leave home, you know. And we knew about Adam going, you know, moving out there. And if you can imagine, you know, in 1981, what that would be like. I mean, nobody had heard much about this kind of thing. Right. So, so for me, it was just, I don't know, I was just really, really, really terrified. And I think she kind of knew it. And uh, I took it real hard. I took the move really hard. And so, so I just think she wanted me to just kind of know that it was going to be okay, you know, for, yeah, for an 11 year old, you know, wrap your head around that. So she, she, w w I just remember going to the mall. I remember entering the, the Sears and everything. And, and, uh, we just, you know, we had a nice time. I just remember. And, and it just, it, I guess it was just one of those things where, you know, 11 year old mind can, can, you know, come out of that, come out of that and say, okay, well, I'm not, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, it's not yeah. like the guy's, you know, sitting around the corner waiting for me. Right. Chris Stewart, you know, right, yeah. So, so, so you were just you moved there. You had recently had divorced parents. Um, you Correct. were, you were, um, your mother was pro probably trying to get you out and get get you back into life and and being a kid exactly. And you go out exactly. to the mall and stuff like that. And uh, um, mm -hmm. so, maybe maybe describe sort of what happened um, that was terrifying and how and how it happened to you sure okay well um i i've i've had to kind of go back and 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 look at you know where 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 was this you know because um a lot of years have passed and i guess maybe you know without trying to sound like this is about me i mean there's a bigger purpose for this i believe um, but, uh, what was I going to say? Um, just kind of lost my train of thought. Well, that's okay. We all Let's do Talk it. about your encounter. Yeah. Because, uh, Chris, your encounter was not at the Hollywood Mall when you encountered, no, it, uh, uh, Jeffrey it Dahmer. It was at a diner. Okay. So that's what I wanted to say. Um, I, I, I can't, I wish I could give you the name of a diner. Right. I, I don't know the name of that. It's been 36 years, you know, um, and I had to, I haven't always realized who this person was that I encountered it up until about a year ago. Okay, so it's been a really, kind of a, just a weird kind of thing to realize. So it was a diner, and it was in Hollywood. Okay, I've been able to establish that. It was in a strip mall. Um, it was a small, you know, small strip mall. It wasn't huge. Right. And it was just a little diner. I, I, I want to say maybe it was Cuban food. I'm not positive. And it was kind of on the, um, kind of on the corner or the, the, the corner suite, uh, of the, uh, the strip mall. And I just remember going into the strip mall and uh, with my mother, it was just her and I, and, uh, we walked in and there was a little description of the, of the restaurant to maybe help people kind of understand the kind of the spooky spot I was in. Um, as you walk in, you know, there's, there was tables and chairs, you know, to, to my left. And then on the right, you just walk along a wall. I just remember the, the, you know, the, the sort of, uh, structure of this. And you kind of walk along a wall. And then you, as you get to the end of the wall, there's the cash register. Well, we stopped there and we just took an immediate table there to the left. But on the other side of that wall, um, if you were standing at the register and looking down, Looking that way, there's on the other side of the wall. It was like a little corridor, uh, sort of hallway, and there was a payphone back there on the other side of the wall, as well as uh, uh, restrooms. And uh, I don't. At some point, I, I can't. I, I, I imagine we had finished eating. I don't. I don't quite remember. But I just. I, had, I said uh, I was very close with my grandparents, and uh, I said I asked my mom if I could call my my grandma and grandpa because I. I guess I knew there was a phone over there. Maybe I'd go into the bathroom. I don't know. So that, that's what I did. I, she said she allowed me to do that, and, and so I went over there, and no, I just got on the payphone and uh, made a collect call to my, my grandparents. And um, and so I was on the phone, and uh, just, you know, I, I again, I, I was 
really loved my grandparents, and this was part of the whole difficulty of, of moving. And I was just really, really glad to be talking to them. You know, I can remember just feeling really happy and, and engaged. But after talking to them about, uh, you know, I don't, I can't, say specifically how, how many minutes maybe it was five minutes I, maybe it was ten I don't know I, I really don't remember but I noticed that a, a guy walked by me okay um, and you know it was kind of like one of those things where you just see somebody walking by you it, it doesn't really register um, and uh, so that was pretty much that and, and so at that point you know I just remember talking and it's it's really it's really a kind of a a, a magical thing, you know. You, you know, looking back thirty six years and being able to to remember like something in the pit of my stomach, even though I, I think I I know I had turned my back and faced the phone and didn't see anybody walking behind me necessarily. Right. You know, I was moving around. I think there were times when I was facing the restroom and then I'd turn around and face the phone and. But there was just this real sort of a disturbance within my gut that, that seemed to be getting uh, irritated over the over a period of time. I want to say it was you know, five to ten minutes. Like a, just kind of like what something somebody's around me. Something's going on. Going on. You know, much like adults when we know something's not right with a person or something. And I didn't even I didn't notice anything necessarily. But because I was so engaged in the conversation, but um, he he had, he had been walking by me multiple times because not only could I feel it, but there there were times when I I also remember like you know vaguely him walking out one time and then probably walking by another time, and then you know he probably done it a couple more times when my back was turned. That's what I've learned. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to say here. I've, you know, these are things that I've had to kind of come to to understand, and um, and so, so so something just really kind of took over in my body, like, like something's wrong. I, I I didn't know what. I was just anxious, and so eventually I turned back around and I'm facing the, the men's bathroom, and I see this guy come out again, and at that point he kind of looks up at me and looks right in my eyes, and. Um, <clears throat> And my, it was just, you know, it was just, we were all 11, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you guys remember what it's like when you're 11. And if you can, if you could just think about, you know, being in a new city like that at that time and having that happen with Adam and, uh, it just, I don't think I'd ever really been so scared as an 11 year old. Um, so that's part of the reason why I'm telling my story too. It's been, it's been therapeutic to be able to. You oh know, yeah, to it's, talk to Willis. It's a good thing yeah, to talk. Yeah, yeah. And, could, and, you, and you guys a lot. Go can ahead. you also describe how you realized uh, just recently, it was recently that okay, this was yeah. Jeffrey Dahmer? Yes, yes. Uh, this has been a real kind of fascinating thing. I mean, from 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 that aspect of it. I mean, um, it hasn't been necessarily traumatic to just to, to discover it, although the. the Experience was dramatic. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so how this happened was was this was about a year ago. Um, I was on my iPhone, and um, you know, I I look at all kinds of different things on YouTube. You know, um, yeah. I just there's, there's so much information to be gained on there, and uh, it just so happened that uh, the press conference um, uh, from the John Walsh was was having with his you know with his wife and. You know, his kids were there too, and and, and they were um, just they were basically making the statement that they that they found that they discovered who, who you know who, who took their their son, you know. And I was at that time. I I remember being kind of like, oh wow, you know, I could, I was I was like happy. I was I was glad to to know that, you know, because I had always sort of wondered, you know, I know I wondered for a lot of years. So I went in and watched the the thing and. It was just like, wow, I must feel like, you know, like or such a relief considering everything. And that was it. And then um, the next day, um, I was on YouTube again, and uh, it was, it was, I started to see these different interviews that came up with um, Willis and, uh, you know, these, you know, these, they were children at the time, but they're adults now. 
and they were just they were talking about Jeffrey Dahmer, and uh, my 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 first instinct was like that's just there's just no way. I mean, what is this? You know. So I just I just happened to click on it and decided to listen to it. You know, I was like, this this is interesting. You know, I mean, I had no idea that Jeffrey Dahmer ever was ever in Florida. You know, I mean, I, I really didn't. Um, so as I was listening to it, it, it was just the weirdest thing. It, they were. I decided to listen because I I started to realize that you know these people were were credible. You know, <laughs> and. Um, it just, it was like, it just struck me all at once. Every, everything that I just told you that what happened in that restaurant, um, I remembered. And, but, but the weird thing was, was that, um, I, 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 I couldn't, I could never pin him, pin, pin him together. Um, it was almost like it was, I just couldn't identify him, you know? And then I, the first thing I did when I came off of YouTube was I went on to the internet and I Googled Dom or Young, like as a young person. And these pictures popped up with his long, wavy hair and his glasses. And immediately, I mean, it was, it was like, that's him. That's, 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 that's this is, I had this encounter with the same guy. And I, it was just very surreal and just everything at once it happened to me. And, uh, it was, I don't know. It was just really weird to discover. And, uh, I just thought, you know, I have to tell my story. I have to tell somebody about this. So this is this is amazing. I mean, this is crazy. You know, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, just all, all different kinds of what, emotions going through my, my body. That that's who this was. And well, um, originally, I mean, I, like, I, go ahead. When you go back when you're 11 and you're at the uh, restaurant, the diner, and you're on the phone and mm-hmm. you're uh, talking to grandparents and just kind of being a kid, probably. You know, antsy back and forth, and you you finally yeah. you finally um, got eye to eye where you, you've noticed him staring at you in in the eyes, like in the face there when he came out of the bathroom. Um, mm-hmm. And you said that that was a um, kind of scary or maybe nerve wracking. I'm not sure what um, what mm-hmm. what was in your mind at that time. Like, so you're talking to your grandparents. You're fairly happy. You've had some food probably with your mother and you're relaxed and you're having fun kind you know and all of a sudden uh you spot the guy and the guy's staring at you can you that's remember? a really really good could, go ahead can I, you, I, was gonna... I was gonna say but can you remember um what feeling came across you and all of a sudden what what you thought about this guy like this what was in your mind oh that's a really really good question um uh, well, I, I, the, the, the thing that, that, that hit me was, it was like a, a, a just an aura that was about him that was so much different than, than any human being you could come across. I mean, it's, it was just unthinkable. Like I couldn't wrap my head around what, what kind of human being this was. That's how it felt. I mean, you know, I was like, uh, it was just, I couldn't gather my thoughts necessarily, but I can remember thinking it, um, that this guy has done something really, really, really bad. I mean, not just, we all do bad things, you know, yeah. <laughs> at times. But I knew that there was something about this, this guy, you know, again, I'm 11. Right. Uh, but I knew that he did something that's, uh, he, that he was a very, he was dangerous. It was, there was a danger about him. Um, and I want to describe him to you, I, I, you know, if you'll let me. Um, sure. Yeah, go for it. He, he, gosh, I mean, he, he, when I saw Jeffrey Dahmer, I mean, and, and I'm not just saying this, I mean, I don't know, I haven't seen the, the new movie about him, but they did a really good job uh, depicting and, and you know, um, that character, I mean, that's what he looked like. But he looked a little bit older. I mean, he looked older than that. But the, I don't know if you noticed those clothes that he wore. Um, so that, that those were the things that, that that stood out to me. It was like, why, why didn't I realize this? You know, I, as I saw him, as it hit me, it was like I started to look at his clothes, and you know, he was he was unshaven, and and his hair was messy, and um, 
he had his glasses on. I still remember the, the shine of the glasses, you know, as he looked at me. And, and even when he walked by the first time, I mean, I mean he just looked uh, outdated to me um, and just really, really scary. I mean, I guess I guess it was, you know, kind of like a, like a Hannibal Lecter in a way, you know, <laughs> you know I mean. Well, for an eleven-year-old, well, I guess. I, I was going to say it sounds like Stephen was at, in there, but if uh, now, <laughs> when, I wasn't uh, in there that day. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, uh, a little bit older. Hey, no, but I'm uh, I'm trying to. Catch- he was scary, guys. I mean, he was really, really scary. He looked really, really, really weird. Yeah, that's really what, weird. I'm trying to capture. So you actually, uh, mm-hmm. it just came right across. It did it just come right across your whole mind and body all of a sudden everything fear everything across. everything about it his his look and um as i as i look back i mean i remember that uh you know i thought that he was very very dangerous and um he wanted to you know I've, I've come to realize that basically this person was he wanted to kill me i mean i've had i've I, I, obviously this is in hindsight i mean i, I know about jeffrey Dahmer now but I know we all have learned what's been on, what was on Jeffrey Dahmer's mind. I mean, he killed people yeah. and, you know, had sex with them, basically. So, uh, so just to realize that, and now, it, then it all made sense, right? Well, he wanted to kill me. I mean, no wonder he, no wonder I felt that way. Yeah, he was <laughs> you know definitely I mean? in credit, credit to mode that day, for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, he wanted to kill me. And I, and I, if he would have had the opportunity, he would have uh-huh. grabbed uh, Chris. You know, I mean, that's what he was there for. That, you, you know, it's pretty obvious that, you know, Jeff had access to a blue van. He was riding around, so he would have needed to stop to use restrooms. He would have needed to get gas in the van. He would have needed to eat uh, because it was uh, a number of months that he had access to this blue van. And it's the same blue van that was seen at all three uh, sites that are relevant to Adam Walsh's abduction, the Hollywood Mall, the turnpike where Adam Seven Head was found, and the location where Jeffrey Dahmer worked, and uh, where I believe Adam was murdered in the meter room behind the store where Jeffrey Dahmer worked. Hmm. As well, listen, you can go to my website, frustratedwitness.com, and listen to other similar stories to Chris, of other witnesses that have had encounters with Jeffrey Dahmer when he was down here, and they all say very similar things to what Chris is saying. You know, his aura, his persona that day, because most of them were, he was always in predatory mode. Even the day I had my encounter with him, at first I didn't realize he was in predator mode. I didn't realize, you know, I was, my feeling was that he was just very, very, very lonely, and he wanted someone to talk to really bad. But it became so intense, the encounter, and I was 34 at the time, and I was a little nervous with this guy staring at me. And so I was watching him, and I'm one of the witnesses at the Hollywood Mall, and this was at the same location where Adam was abducted on the same day. And I actually saw him going into the toy department, but then I turned around and left. Hmm. So... And, and so you had the same feeling, like you had the same sort of... Oh, absolutely. Like That's he, why I followed him. Yeah. I knew somebody was going to be in trouble, and this was before Adam was abducted. But I turned around and left, and I didn't know about an abduction until later on that night, that evening, when I heard it on the news. And I knew it had to be that guy I followed to the toy department. I just didn't know who he was until 10 years later. Similar to what Chris is saying. You know, it would be years later before he realized that was who the guy was. Yeah. Uh, and, and Yeah, that's, that's, that's the one. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go I was just going to say, I guess. I guess coming into this, you know, that was the thing that I was worried about, that, you know, people were going to think that, how could he, you know, 36 years later, you know, claim this? You know, it's it's been, it's been, all I can say is it's been really weird. It's been surreal, you know. I mean, same time the movie's coming out and everything. I, I don't know why this all happened at this time, but I am 100% sure. I mean, I, I you know, I, I hope I described him. You know, in, in a way that you know you guys can identify him. You know, through me. <laughs> well, well, you did very good, Chris. Because if you listen to the other witnesses on my website, you'll see they all have the same description and feelings that you had. Hmm. Because there's other pictures I know where he's got short hair and a mustache, and so I kind of had to go back and do my research and see that. You know, I mean, that's just that was just one look that he had. You know, and yeah, yeah. and. 
That's, well, you know, you we know. all change, uh, you know, as time goes, you know, do things. Um, sure. What, sure. So when you when you saw that, can can you follow through? And what did you do um, once the eye connection happened, and you were like, "Oh, this guy's evil," and uh, you kind of got the fear on a little bit. Uh, where did it go from there? What happened after that? Um, I you know I basically went into shock mode. I, I just I really did. I just I went into shock, and I, you know, I just. I don't remember the, exactly what I said to my grandparents, but I know it had. To, I know it was. I have to go. You know, I have to go. I'm going to go ahead and go. You know. Yeah. And that was probably just about it. You know, because so I was. Did, I was did you go scared, back to your scared. mother, and did you tell your mother then, or? Yeah. yeah so then I hung up the phone and uh, I walked over to my mom, and I, and I, I can still remember like my breath was. And I could hardly breathe, you know, like my, I had to catch up with my breathing. And I, as I got over, as I walked over to her, I was like, mom, this, mom, this guy's, uh, this guy's watching me. And she was like, you know, she kind of took a deep breath. She said, who, you know, and at that, she had her back to the, to the, uh, you know, the register and the little corridor area. And I, and, and, and as soon as she said, who, I said, I said, that guy right there. And he came walking. I guess he'd gone back in the bathroom again, and he came walking out. And as soon as she turned around, he was right there. I mean, just just visible. And he just he just walked out the front door. Just walked out the front door and took off. And I just looked at it. My mom and I said, "That guy, you know, he's something's it's just not right." And yeah, I mean, that's another story, you know, in terms right. of my mom and that kind of thing. I, but uh, I don't think she realized the severity of it. Well, you know? no, no. I mean, it's it's not something. How could she, right? Yeah, it's not something that you're uh, typically. I mean, I don't go to a restaurant and sitting there thinking, okay, who's going to kill me and who's who's a murderer. I'm, that's kind of uh, yeah. That's not especially in eighty one. I would imagine she wasn't thinking in those terms. You know, right? Uh, um, so so since then. Um, how has this affected your life? Like, especially the last year here, now that you've kind of, you're talking about it now, you've uh, met with uh, Willis and you, you've you given your your statement, sort of, and you're moving on. How is this affecting your life now? Well, it's, actually, that's, that's a really good question, too. I appreciate right, yes, that. I do this for a question. living. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's been kind of a thing where, I, I, I guess I'm still asking myself that, you know, like how how did that affect my life? You know, I'm not I'm not quite sure how necessarily it, it did. I, I I think it has, um, but I I definitely feel I guess just from my own from my own well being or my own perspective, uh, you know, it's been it's been kind of like I needed to talk about it, you know. So it's kind of been therapy to talk to Willis and have somebody say, you know, I believe you. I you describe this person. Uh, I can tell that you're telling the truth. I, I know that you're telling the truth about this. So it's been just really, uh, because, you know, I didn't really have that from my mom at that time, you know, and again, she didn't know, you know, and, um, so I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's affected my life. I, I can tell that it's affected me in ways because of, you know, the fact that I've needed to really uh, discuss it, you know, 36 years later, you know, after kind of realizing it. How How do people around you respond, but? Um, I don't tell everybody about it. You know, I, it's it, it was a long time ago, and it, it is something that you know is 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 going to be in the past. And I mean, it is in the past, obviously. You know, I mean, although I do hope that you know something better could come out of out of this. And you know, I you know I I know Willis has a um, you know he's seeking good. You know, he's seeking good in his works and. And I hope that I can contribute to that, and it, you know, through this. But that, you know, I'm close with my siblings and stuff, my sister and stuff, and she, you know, she lived there at the time, and she remembered the restaurant, and uh, she she wasn't there that day. She asked me, she said, "Are you sure I wasn't there?" And I said, "If you were there, you would have remembered him." And she goes, "Oh yeah, you're right. You know, I'm, I'm really close with with my sister." Yeah. And uh, it, it was just uh, not a good. It was not. There's nothing against Florida or Hollywood, Florida. It was just those kind of the breakup of our parents and. It was just a time that was tough. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I don't really, you know, I don't go around telling 
too many people about it. I've talked, I've, I've told a few people about it, and especially her, and, um, you know, they, they believe me. You know, I, I talked to my mom about it a little bit, and she said, I'm just so thankful that you had the, the, the instincts or whatever it was that, you know, that God gave you some, something that told you that something was wrong there. It's, it's kind of amazing. I didn't realize, you know, that we can have these, these, these sort of uh, intuitions that, as a child. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's possible. Um, so, yeah. Will, Willis, how did you come across Chris? Chris actually contacted me. Uh, again, he was watching that uh, closing statement from John Walsh, and then the next day, YouTube has a way of connecting a video similar to the one you're watching. So when he went to YouTube, all of a sudden, other YouTube videos started popping up, and one of them was uh, an interview I did with Mia Taylor, another witness who was at the mall on the day Adam was abducted. And that's the interview that he was referring to when he said he, uh, he yes. heard another interview. And so then he contacted me after that on my Facebook page, I believe it was. And Terry, too. The, 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 yeah, the, as well as your uh, co-host there, your... your uh, your host also had his own encounter with Jeffrey Dahmer, although it was a completely different setting because Dahmer wasn't in predatory mode. But he's had a number of encounters or, or meetings with Jeffrey Dahmer. Steve? Okay. Yeah. Back in the, in the, uh, in the day. <laughs> yeah, it was a few years ago. That was in the 70s. Uh, uh, I don't know. Actually, it been 79. It been 79. Wow. And um, yeah, Donald, Donald was going through medical school in uh, Fort Sim, Houston, Texas, and Steve was also there at the same medical school. Well, you you guys will have to forgive me. I'm I'm learning here too. I that's that's interesting. Oh yeah, there's there's plenty of encounters. I didn't know. And a lot of a lot of people have have had experiences with uh, Dahmer, and sometimes they didn't realize it. And now it's kind of coming out that way. Well, yeah, and also Al, okay. keep in mind. That Dahmer's boss said Dahmer would come in with scratches all over him and his eyeglasses all busted up. So obviously those were encounters. I'd love to hear from those people. You know, this there has to be many, many encounters out there with people that uh, that have stories to tell, similar to Chris's story and other witnesses. Well, and do we know mm -hmm. now? Now was Dahmer uh, the type that would cruise other men in the bathrooms as well for? Um, maybe just for encounters and not necessarily to kill them. Is that? Do we know about that? Uh, I, I know. All I know is in Milwaukee, he did go to gay bars and malls. You know, and down here, he obviously went to malls because he went to uh, not only the Hollywood Mall but uh, the Twin City Mall in West Palm Beach, where he tried to abduct Terry Keaton. And you can also listen to Terry Keaton's statement on my uh, website, frustratedwitness dot com, as well. Do you think that? Um when you had an encounter with him, Willis, when you were at the mall, do you think he was sort of interested in you in a certain way, or was it just just to talk? Like what? Because there's what? a difference between what he, you know, when he was encountering you, you were in your 30s, compared to right. then he goes down to Sears, and then Adam Walsh is just a little kid. So there's a big difference there. What, what do you think his purpose was for you, or thought process was for you? Right. Well, my thinking when he first uh, smiled at me and asked me how the weather was, you know, he said, hi, dear, nice day, isn't it? That was his first initiation uh, contact. But um, my thinking was this was just some goofy guy that wanted somebody to talk to really bad. But as, as I didn't respond to him, it became more and more intense. And as he finally stomped out of the radio shack, because this was in the, a radio shack in the same mall, I knew right then somebody was going to be in trouble. But again, back in 1981, never did I think a six-year-old boy would be in trouble. I think I was thinking he was going to go up to somebody else, you know, an adult like me. Right. And it would be a words exchange, a shoving match, a fight at the most. That I never dreamed that there would be an abduction of a child. Yeah, yeah, because that's not. The, but I, obviously, yeah, obviously, uh, he did leave this feeling, this uh, of being a very, very dangerous person, and that's why I was watching and keeping an eye on him. But when he went into the toy department and didn't come back out again, I was thinking, oh, he must be playing the video games. And so I just turned around and left him went home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you ever think about what would have happened if you would have struck up a conversation with him? Well, I, 
I, I wouldn't have, but yeah, obviously, uh, my thinking at the time was once you say anything that initiates more conversation, and I just didn't want to even have a conversation. You know, I was in radio shack you know, not to look for somebody that I converse with, you know. Yeah. So I, I just didn't want to converse with anyone, at, at, you know, so I just ignored him, and he didn't like that too much. No. But, no. Um, uh, yeah, I, obviously, he was looking for somebody to go with him or whatever you can imagine. You know, uh, my feeling as uh, of what he was up to has changed since he was captured, and I realized who this was and what he did in Milwaukee. Obviously, I'm thinking, oh, that's what he was doing. He was trying to, you know, get me to go back to his apartment maybe and offer me some drinks, you know. Yeah. He, he and, needed... With some sedatives in or sleeping pills like he was doing. Who knows? Who knows what he was going to do after that? I'll never know because it never happened. Yeah. Yeah, you could have been lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Literally, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so now, um, now, now, so Willis, so you're going to put this book out. How many, how many yeah. people have you come across since the last edition? How many more witnesses uh, are, you know, people that have well, talked to you uh, since? I've, I've had a few, but the hard part is uh, just uh, figure out who's trying to just enjoy the Yeah, you're going to have to be careful, right? You want to um, be accurate and, and tell the truth. And, um, right. Uh, so what kind of advice do you give to someone like Chris that comes to you, and once you've talked to them a few times and you kind of figure that they're real, you've decided, okay, this person's um, pretty pretty honest, pretty accurate, and has had some experience. What's What's your advice for someone like that? Well, you know, I appreciate Chris coming on to your show because Chris, like me, I'm not, I've never done a radio show in my life until this case. And I was on a, a quite a few radio shows since, you know, so I'm not really a, a talkative radio show, one of your best hosts or guests that you could have. But uh, I've come to learn to do this, and I'm sure Chris will get better at, it, you know, speaking on radio as he does more shows. The first show is always the hardest, and this is his first mm -hmm. show. And um, I've, I've just come to accept doing this because, I, you know, I just cannot let a police department pin a murder on an innocent man. And, and they're known for doing this uh, down here in South Florida. There's been many people that have been put in prison and found decades later to be innocent with DNA. And then when you find out how they ended up in prison, they were just like railroaded there. Yeah. You know, they go after the poor, the weak, the, uh, the downtrodden, uh, who have no education, no money, no family to come to their aid, and they pin murders on them. Uh, um, uh, fortunately, in the Adam Walsh case, the, the person they pinned this murder on was already deceased. He died in prison uh, for another uh, unrelated case. So he didn't get to spend any time on the, in prison on the Adam Walsh case. But there have been many others. You know, there's uh, Frankly Smith spent 14 years on death row where he died of pancreatic cancer before they found out that he was innocent. And then uh, you find out how, how they get witnesses, you know, to say that it was him by showing them, uh, uh, in some cases, an array of photos. And when a witness doesn't recognize any one of them, they'll say, you sure it wasn't this guy? They'll point one out, which they, Stephen can tell you that's something they're not supposed to do. And they'll say, we have proof it was him. And some witnesses not wanting to let a murderer of an eight-year-old child uh, get away with it will make the identification. Yeah. And, yeah. And so that's what they do. And they try to do the same thing to some of the Adam uh, Walsh witnesses. Because uh, Jenny Ward was one that told me that uh, uh, Detective Mark Smith try to get her to assign uh, the, and date the back of one of the photos. It was a photo of Otis 2, which was a number five photo in a six-photo lineup. But she refused to do it. But he, he did the same thing, telling her he has proof that it was him and all this, the exact same thing they tried on her. Yeah. Wow. It's quite a story. So now, Chris, um, so what's next for you now, Chris? Like, how's, how's life? Is everything, uh, are you, are you going to pursue anything um with this story, or what's your plans? 
Well, I guess I, I wanted to say, um, as I was thinking about and listening to Willis talk, you know, um, I guess whenever I've, um, most of the time, whenever you, you know, you hear about Jeffrey Dahmer's victims and, and, and such, um, you know, the, so what some of the, the, the psychiatrists have said is, is, you know, the kids weren't his MO and, and I'm not saying that they, that they were his, his, his main MO. I guess I just, when I, when I hear that or when I, when I, when I see that, um, I'm just a little surprised that they don't, you know, it's like they don't, they kind of bypass some of these incidents that from what I understand, I mean, there was, you know, there was other, other boys my age, you know? And so I guess, um, I, I, I'm not, I don't quite understand that, you know, I, I mean, I do and I don't, I understand that that was why he, you know, he, he was originally arrested because he was killing grown men, but I mean, you know, there, there was these, there's tons of encounters. Yeah. And keep, keep yeah. in mind, yeah. when you talk about MOs, the only reason it doesn't fit his MO is because the police are trying to distance themselves between Dahmer and the Adam Walsh case. And uh, Adam had his head severed. That's something Jeffrey Dahmer has done many times over. So if that doesn't fit his MO, I don't know what does. Frankly, I just think that someone forgot to tell him when he was down in Florida that he had an MO to stick to. Yeah. Yeah, you can't always, you know, people, um, you know, they they put, uh, you know, references on things. So they sort of say, well, this is this typical MO. And sometimes it is, but then sometimes uh, right. they change. And, and Stephen can tell you, because, you know, that this is more his expertise that, the book on the MOs have been rewritten many times over. I mean, look at the DC snipers, you know, there was supposed to be some white redneck. Yeah. You know, with a white van. There was never no white van, there was never no white redneck with military background, it was two Jamaicans. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I mean I mean I just I one of my books was about Rodney O'Culla, the game show killer, and, and he did that. He was uh, killing and attacking six, eight-year-old girls, but at the same time he was doing it in New York with 35-year-olds and right. and strangling oh. one and killing others and shooting others. And, you know, so it's, they don't always, it's not always cut and dry like that. So Right, and, and also it's the neighborhood you're living in, too. You know, if you're, he was living in a black neighborhood, so uh, near gay boys, so naturally, you know, most of his victims ended up being black gays. Right, yeah. Yeah, there's there's all sorts of uh, angles to it. So, wow. Uh, I guess that's what I don't understand is is, is how come these psychiatrists? And I, I forget their names. I mean, I know there's a couple couple of them that are, that are pretty renowned and stuff. And maybe it's because you know they just don't want to come out and say that publicly. But I mean, if we can figure this out, you know, well, if you, I don't understand how come they can't. Well, they they have David, to write up. This is George Palamo, doctors. Uh, I mean, Don is psychiatrist that, that the court appointed during his trial. I mean, he says Dahmer definitely didn't go for 10 years after Stephen Hicks without committing a murder. So, I mean, he's spot on with his uh, theories. Yeah. And you know what they do is they work up a formula and they stick with it. And it works in the majority mm, of the okay. cases. So that's kind of what they go with. But it doesn't mean it's going to be with all of the cases. So um, you just kind of take it on that way, like if they they do up a, you know, kind of an MO or a, a forensic idea of what someone is, and it, it might be right most of the time, but it's not a hundred percent accurate. There's going to be m- mistakes. There's going to be things that they read wrong. Um, so it's kind of one of those things. They, they, you know, I hope most cops do the best they can with what they they know. Um, and you kind of hope for the best output, but it doesn't always work. Well, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes an, an, an MO, while that's while that's their that's their preference, you know, you, they have to act on what they have. So an MO, while it, it's oftentimes a guideline, you you can't expect to stay on that straight and narrow because it does vary. You know, their their opportunities and, and their victims, they you know, sometimes take them where they can get them. So uh, staying on a straight and narrow MO is not is not wise. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so you just kind of take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like you know. But that, that just always seems. 
that always seems to come back up, though, you know, when it comes to Adam Wallace, is, I guess is from what I've heard, you know, you know, that, that's, that, that always seems to come back up as far as, you know, who, who his killer was. And, yeah. Well, you know, until, until you know. something changes in, in their mind, until they get evidence that they accept as something different, they're not going to change right. it and they're just going to keep repeating it. Um, so right. you just kind of have to take it as is until it does change. And, um, mm. you know, well, I thought, kind of a shame though, I guess when you're on the sidelines, you know, Oh, it, it, totally, totally. Because not, that or... not everything is a hundred percent. Not everything is. Well, in the Adam Walsh case, let me say that, you know, in the beginning, they botched this case up so bad that when Jeffrey Dahmer was captured, they just didn't want to make the connection. It's like, uh, when you mess up, never fess up. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing. Milwaukee police are doing the same thing. There was one guy that was murdered in the exact same building where Jeffrey Dahmer was living, and they don't want to make the connection to Dean Vaughn, who was living one floor above Dahmer in apartment 308. Dahmer was in 213, and because that was an open homicide investigation when uh, Dahmer was captured, and they gave a young boy back to Dahmer, who Dahmer immediately murdered, and there would have been riots in Milwaukee had that had the public known how bad the police really messed up and that they just ignored people in yeah. Milwaukee because it was a black neighborhood. Yeah. And I, I guess that would be, be my answer uh, to you, Alan. I hope could, I did get your name right, right? Oh, yeah. It's Alan? Yeah. Alan? Yeah, sure. Um, and I guess that would be my thing is because is, you'd ask me, you know, going forward, you know, what what's next for me. And I don't have a Willis's book. I, that's something that I more on purchase, you know, I'm just kind of interested in other people who had encounters like I did. Um, and I guess there's, and I, I have my doubts, don't get me wrong, I have a lot of doubts, and I'm sure you guys all do too, but I, I guess I just uh, would hope that maybe something, or in some, some way, somehow, you know, that they could maybe figure this out, you know, and say, hey, you know, maybe he did, maybe he did, maybe he was the one who who took Adam and, and killed him, you know, and, uh, yeah. I, I don't know, but I understand. I, I couldn't imagine, you know, you know, being his parents and all that. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to speak on their grief and, and all that, but it's, it would be nice if, if the truth sometimes could well be known. I, I think, I think that all we can do is, and, and don't, don't think about, uh, you know, doubts and, and negativity. You just think, you know, all you can do is share your experience, you know, uh, uh, tell people right. how you feel, what you, how you see it and how, what happened to you and just, and leave it okay. at that. There's nothing more we can do. We just share our experiences. And I mean, in this particular case, we all have to, uh, you know, it's going to stay the way it is, unfortunately, until, uh, mm -hmm. John Walsh himself, um, decides to make a change because he's kind of um, the one everybody looks to in this case. So until until he does something, um, uh, all we can do is share experiences and talk about what's happened to people we know and ourselves and uh, hope that he comes around because um, I, I don't think you'll see any major changes in any of the opinions in the in any major way until he comes out and decides to uh you know follow up or uh, or do something different gotcha gotcha yeah. thanks for explaining that i i think that's kind of and, and not too many people are going to challenge him when it comes to his son um he has to come around you know so and Alan, that's one of the reasons i wrote my book frustrated witness because uh, you know, I had filed lawsuits against the Hollywood Police Department, and uh, I lost, but not on the merit of the case, but because of political expediency. So I wrote this book, so at least, you know, uh, this the court of public opinion can make their own decision, because there's more than enough evidence, to, you know, circumstantial as it may be, that it was Jeffrey Dahmer. Right. You know, there's police reports with his name on it because he was a witness to finding a dead man behind the store where he worked and his blood spatter in that meter room. Right. And 
it doesn't belong to that dead man because he doesn't have any blood on him. And it was described as one of the best CSI experts in the state of Florida as being indicative of a high-velocity homicidal pattern. Steve, I don't know if you went to my website and looked at the photos of the blood spatter, but what do you think of that blood spatter? Does it look like a homicidal pattern to you? Well, uh, it, it obviously, uh, you know, based on what I saw, and of course, it, uh, if I remember, there were black and white spinal losses. I've been since I've seen those photos. Uh, yes, it does. It doesn't look like it was cut. You know, it wasn't, obviously it wasn't a paper cut. <laughs> right. Now, uh, let me tell you what the Hollywood Police Department says about that blood spatter pattern. They said it could have been two pit bulls that got into that meter room and had a fight. Miami Dade Police Department. Chuck McCulley told me, he's the uh, lead homicide investigator over there in Dade County, told me that he thinks a bird flew into the wall. Hmm. <laughs> because there was a bird in that room, but it was only two inches long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so you see where we're at. Yeah. Well, that's just, why, that's yeah. why the cover of my book, Alan, is a picture of that meter room. And I changed the crime scene tape because my attorney told me every time she looks at that uh, cover... She thinks the crime scene tape should say, because now it says crime scene, do not, uh, do not cross. But she thinks it should say crime scene, do not investigate. So that's why I changed the crime scene tape. On the second edition, you'll see it says crime scene, do not investigate, because they do not want to investigate that meter room. Yeah, that's, They've absolutely refused. That's good. Give that person a raise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, this has been... Uh, uh, very, very interesting. Very good. Um, uh, thank you for both both being here. And um, now, uh, give your website and, and book information one more time, uh, Willis, if you will. Yes, the website is frustratedwitness.com. That's the only website you need to know. I have two websites, but you can link to the, to the other website where all the police files and records are. It's Justice for Adam, but you can just go to my first website and get there. You can go to, from frustratedwitness.com. You can go to the uh, Facebook page. You can go to Amazon and uh, many other places where you can also look at different interviews and different video trailers that I've done for the book. Fantastic. And we will link that to our website as well and put your book on there and again thank you willis and um uh what can i say but thanks very much chris stewart as well for telling your story oh thank you i, I really appreciate it alan